Hi, I'm Sabine Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Absolute Maximum Rating to Power MOSFET. This is the second video on the subject of absolute maximum rating. First one was dedicated to operational amplifiers. So this is a typical table of maximum rating or absolute maximum rating sometimes called and this is for an Infineon power MOSFET 100 volt. So here we have a number of parameters and the limits that you should not exceed. Now it's very important to realize that these are limits not operating point that is you are not expect to work at 137 amp for example. The indication is here that if you exceed it you may damage the unit and this damage could be immediate or it will deteriorate the transistor so that in the long run it'll break down. So these are limits and not operating point. Then there is some footnotes usually in these tables. Very important to look at the footnotes. We'll see it in a minute. So the maximum current, continuous current for this transistor with case of 25 degrees is 177 amp. Now diagram 3 is in fact the safe operating area curves. Okay, what we see here is the limits for operation, pulses or continuous current. This line is actually related to the RDS on, that is if you have say a current of say uh, 20 amp, then the voltage will be this voltage due to the relationship between the voltage and current due to RDS on when the transistor is on. So this has nothing to do with the limits in fact, while here we are reaching a point in which the maximum is 137 for DC or continuous operation, which we are talking about. And this limit is when the voltage across the transistor will be 1.3 volt according to this straight line. So the power dissipated at this point with 137 amp is 180 watt. Now the thermal resistance of this device is specified as 0.7 Kelvin per watt. So the junction to case temperature is 125. If we add to it 25 for the case temperature, which is here, the case temperature is 25, then we come up to 150. Well, this is not a very accurate estimate of this. Maybe it's a little bit higher than that. So it's pretty close to 175, which is the maximum junction temperature. So we see that the limit of 137 amp is actually due to limitation of the junction temperature. Now let's go back now to this straight line. Let's discuss it for a minute here. It shows here a straight line for RDS on. Now from this line and uh, looking at this point, it's a hundred amp and one volt. So the RDS on is supposedly 10 milliohm. Now 10 milliohm is when the temperature is very high. You see that at 25 degree, this is from the Infineon data sheet, 25 degree, the typical resistance RDS on is only 4 milliohm. Well, 98% of the spread is a little bit higher than that, but 10 is when the temperature is very high. So the curve that they are showing here is actually for very high temperature. The idea is, I think, that when you have a high current, then the transistor heats up, temperature goes up, so you have to take into account a higher RDS on. But the point is, that if you are at a lower current, say current here, temperature doesn't go up that much. So therefore this slope is incorrect. So in fact, to be accurate, this curve should be something like that. That is, at the very beginning, it should represent the four milliohm. This is this one here. And as you go up, since the transistor is heating up, then the resistance is going up and up and the slope will be changing accordingly and at this point where well, they are showing 10 million which is a little bit high because it's a very high temperature but still it is close to 10 million. 
So this is actually the curve that should be here rather than this straight line, which many manufacturers are actually showing it this way. I'm now moving to the continuous current for 100 degrees centigrade case temperature, and it is specified to be 105. So again, if I'm doing a calculation of the junction temperature, which is the power, this I square, assuming again 10 milliohm of RDS on, 0.7 for the thermal resistance, I'm coming up again for this 177, 75, which is the maximum temperature. So again, these two are apparently limited by the temperature of the junction. Moving now to the pulse drain current. This is an instantaneous current for a short time. Doesn't say what is the width of this pulse, but it's referring again to this uh, diagram three from which we can understand the following. 548 is for pulses which are shorter than 100 microseconds. Okay, if the pulse is 100 microseconds or shorter, then the current could be 548. But if the pulse is one millisecond, then the maximum current is lower than that. And obviously at 10 milliseconds, it's even lower. So this number is for pulses which are 100 micro second or shorter. An interesting parameter is this avalanche energy single pulse. Now what is it? What it is is in fact the ability of the transistor to absorb energy while it is actually breaking down. That is if you are trying to exceed the voltage of the transistor by injecting a current then the transistor can actually absorb the energy while in the breakdown mode. That is, this transistor is 100 volt transistor, so it'll be like a zener of 100 volt capable of absorbing 340 millijoule. Now this information is given by another company, Toshiba, for this transistor, which is a similar transistor, and here they're giving also the dependence on temperature. That is a 25 degree, the capability is to absorb something like, I don't know, 140, something like that, millijoule. But you can see that as the case temperature is going up, the ability to absorb, this is the initial temperature that is before the pulse, okay? So as the temperature goes up, the ability to absorb going down up to really low value when the temperature is high. Why is this? Because uh, the transistor ability to absorb the energy depends on how long can it sustain the energy before the junction temperature goes up above 175. So if you are already close to it, like 125 the case temperature, then the amount of energy that can be absorbed until you get to 175 is small. I'm going to talk about it in the next slides again to explore it further. Now here they're showing the experiment or an example, you might say, of this avalanche. What they are showing here is a transistor. You turn it on, there is a power supply VDD, there is an inductor. And consequently, when the transistor is on, the current goes up, okay? And then you turn it off. As you turn it off, the current is in the inductor is interrupted. Consequently, the voltage tries to go up until the transistor breaks down. So here is the transistor breaking down. This is the breakdown voltage of the transistor. And then the voltage here, which is now higher than VDD, VDD is 80 volt here, and the breakdown is 100. So therefore, the IDT is the opposite direction, and therefore, the current goes down. It's still going in this direction into the transistor, but the slope is down until it reaches zero. And then they give this equation for the energy absorbed in such a setup, and it is half L I squared, this is the energy initial energy of the inductor. And then there is an expression here. This is the breakdown voltage, and then breakdown voltage minus VDD. First glance, this is very strange, because what it says is the following. If 
the breakdown voltage is close to VDD, so this approaches zero, then the amount of energy absorbed will be very large. Well, maybe you like to think about it for a minute. I'm going to discuss it later on to explain it, but try to figure out why is this so? Okay, it's kind of counterintuitive. You assume that if the voltage VCC is close to the breakdown, then the current will be lower. Why is it, I mean, the energy will be lower. Why will it be higher? But that's the fact, that's correct. So let's develop this equation. This is this equation given by Toshiba. And I'm developing it by, first of all, saying that the amount of energy absorbed by the transistor is the breakdown voltage times the charge through it. And the charge is I pick over two. This is the average times T2. This is the charge times voltage is energy. Now the time that it takes for this discharge now depends on the inductance I pick and uh, the voltage across the inductor. This is the voltage across the inductor. So if I plug this T sub 2 into here, I'm getting this equation that Toshiba is showing. And you see that in this equation, again, you have this difference. And here is the explanation. You see that if this difference is very small, then the slope here, which depends on this difference, is becoming shallower and shallower, and therefore the time that it takes is longer and longer, and therefore the amount of energy that will be absorbed becomes larger and larger. And here I'm showing it in a sort of a intuitive way, just to explain this whole concept, which is kind of baffling. If you have two voltage sources, which let's assume that they have the same voltage and then you have an inductor with some initial current this current will go on flowing continuously forever if these are ideal voltage sources because the voltage across the inductor is zero the idt is zero there is no change in the um, the intensity of the current so the current will go on flowing so this means that when the difference between these voltages is close to zero, then of course the time will be very large. Then, but if the difference is small, then the time will be larger than when the difference is large. So this is why we have it, this minus here, this explan intuitive explanation of this uh, expression here. Now Infineon is giving this information for the avalanche in a different way, that is as a function of temperature. They are showing here that there is an absolute limit of 100 amp, and this is the peak value. And then they are showing that for 25 degree, the pulse could be T2, as we called it, could be like 40 microseconds. This brings up to 400 millijoule. This will be the value and 100 degrees centigrade for case, this is the case before the pulse is coming in, is then limited to 100 millijoule, and of course, if the case is 150, it's even lower than that. Now, why is this? We can explain it in terms of this so-called thermal impedance. The thermal impedance is the thermal resistance or impedance when you are working in the pulse mode, okay, not continuous mode. And this last curve here is for single pulse, which we are talking about. This all avalanche information is given for a single pulse or when the pulses are apart for a long time. Now, it shows here that if you have a 40 microsecond pulse, then the effective thermal resistance is 0.03 as compared to 0.7 for the continuous case. So it is a very low thermal resistance. And the explanation is that when the pulse is short, then the thermal capacity of the transistor actually absorbs the energy. So you really don't invoke a conduction of heat, but rather absorption by the thermal capacity. So this is why this is a small number and 
Then if we consider that this is only 0.03, here it is, and I'm looking at the power dissipated, which let's have a look at, for example, here, we are talking about 100 amp peak. So the average during the pulse duration is divided by two. So here it is. The voltage across the transistor is 100 volt. So the power during the pulse is five kilowatt. And now this power times the thermal impedance, which is 0.03 plus 25, brings us again to 175. So we can see that in this case, also the limitation is actually the temperature of the junction. Now I'm moving to these parameters. First of all, the gate voltage cannot exceed minus two to plus 20. There's not much that we can add, although there, there are some question what will happen if the pulse is higher than that, that is the gate voltage is higher than that, but for a very, very short duration, it doesn't say here. And then there is a limit for the power that the unit can be dissipated at 25 degrees centigrade. And this, we already said, the limitation of 175 junction temperature. Now, if the power is 214, thermal resistance is 0.7, so this is the junction to case temperature plus the ambient temperature. We come again to 175, which is again the limitation here in this case of this maximum power. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you found it of interest and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.